The five modules of traffic police enforcement are Module 1 and 2, Strategic Leadership in Road Policing Using Intelligence and Analysis Module 3, The Community Relationship Communicating the Message Module 4, Operational Policing, which has two parts Part 4.1, Planning Strategies and Tactics Part 4.2, Checkpoint Operations Module 5, Focus on the Future, Working with a Strategic Framework Dr. Ray Shui is a specialist in international road policing and traffic law enforcement providing good practice solutions and road strategies to meet jurisdictional needs. Dr. Shui will be presenting the modules for traffic police enforcement. Module 1 and 2, Strategic Leadership in Road Policing Using Intelligence and Analysis This module introduces road safety and the role played by road policing and traffic law enforcement. It addresses the foundation of effective data management and the importance of sharing data to achieve road safety outcomes. Dr. Shui will start Modules 1 and 2. Uh, strategic issues of strategic leadership, of partnerships and community work. Uh, we want to understand road trauma. And you can see here uh, with the various uh, ways I have um, represented uh, issues here. This one here is the most important. It's a spider graph, we call it. And this is looking at what actually happens with road trauma, where the crashes are happening at what time of the day, and where the enforcement is happening. So in this example here, uh, you can see this is uh, midnight, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 a.m., going round the clock to 24 hours. And you can see uh, that the road trauma uh, is occurring, the red line is the road trauma, and it's happening at uh, 1, 2, 3 o'clock at night, or 10 or 11 o'clock at night. No police officers are working out there. We've all gone home to bed. Okay? So this straight away tells me that we are not putting our resources where we need to. Why? Everybody wants to be home at their, with their families at night time. The police work in the daytime and they all go home at night time and the crashes happen. People drink and drive, they speed. So, just some simple things uh, to identify when the crashes are happening. Picture, uh, pick out the days of the week that the crashes are happening. Uh, the locations uh, where uh, the major crashes are occurring and the different times of the day. So. The pictures, uh, it doesn't matter what they look like, you need to know. So it's important to understand the, the statistics, but for everybody who is working in this area to have pictures rather than the figures because we, it reports that in every province there's uh, so many fatalities and injuries and whatever, and we look at it and we say, ah, oh, maybe it's 2% more than last year or 2% less, but if I can understand pictures, uh, I can see and appreciate and then I can do something about it. But we need to understand the risk factors. So every day there's millions and millions of uh, cars and people and pedestrian movements. How come we only have 20 crashes or 100 crashes a day? Why? We need to understand what is happening, what is the reason. And we look at uh, some famous uh, research that's been done uh, 20 years ago and it's like the, the Swiss cheese, the lines, uh, the holes in the Swiss cheese, when they line up, when somebody is in a hurry, when somebody has been drinking and driving, when a young child runs out in front of a car, all these issues happen every day, but sometimes they all line up and somebody is killed. So, and we need to look at those in terms of the risk assessment, the likelihood of the crashes happening, and the risk management implying some strategy. Okay, so the risk factors, they will be different in your countries, uh, speed, alcohol, uh, failing to have seat belts, uh, failing to wear helmets, uh, using mobile phones while driving. It's just been declared by recent research that this is one of the leading issues of crashes throughout the world. And particularly in the Asian countries, I see people riding motorbikes, texting, texting one in each hand on the phone. Uh, in the motor cars. So you have all these complications that uh, cause crashes. So you need to understand clearly what the issues are. But do you have a road policing strategic plan? One that I can check on the internet. It might be in your own language, 
but I need to be able to check it. Do you have one of those? Yes or no? Okay. If the answer is no, then we need to develop one as a first part of the strategy. You can't say that the national road safety strategy will, will be sufficient. Right? Underneath that, each organisation, it doesn't matter what organisation you represent, should have a strategy that works towards achieving the national goals. Do we ensure, as a, as a matter of principle, that all drivers change their driving behaviours to comply with the law? We say, impossible. How, how can we get all drivers, millions of drivers out there? But we need to have that strategy to work towards. Do we focus on high risk offences? Or do we be like in, uh, I was in the Emirates in Dubai and they say we've had a blitz over the weekend and we have booked 10, we have issued infringement to 10, 11,000 drivers. And I look at the breakdown, 10,000 are for parking offences. They say, crazy. That's, that's not law enforcement. Right? You go to Dubai and you see cars doing 150 and 200 kilometres an hour on the freeways. Right? They all get away with it and yet they book people for, in, for uh, parking offences. Why? Because it's easy. Is officer safety your highest priority? So we look at what happens in China. About 500 officers every year are killed on the roads. Right? That's a lot of officers killed on the roads in doing their enforcement duties. In Vietnam, there are many officers killed uh, on the roadway doing enforcement, but we don't know because they don't publish the statistics. Right? So the other countries, it's always a problem. In America, a gun-toting society, and we have less than 200 officers in America killed each year. Right? So, and most of those are not killed through firearm offences, uh, they are killed through uh, traffic offences, traffic stops. And are we fully using our data for interventions or do we just have a data, data bank? We know how many people are killed. We know that speed's a major issue. So we look at those issues and we say, are we focusing what the real issues? And we want you honestly in every country to answer five out of five for good practice. If you can't answer five out of five, then we need to work towards uh, getting five out of five. Planning, we want to modify driver behaviour, we want to focus our resources because we don't have enough resources to, to do what we are required to do as a matter of principle for the government and we make safety as our highest priority. The officer's safety is a key issue and we want to use data effectively. If we don't use data effectively, we can have all sorts of computer systems and everything at our fingertips. If we don't do something about the data, then we are not using uh, the information that we have uh, correctly and therefore we're not a good leader or manager. Think about good practice and how we can develop the good practice over time. So we have a number of issues. We have standards for law enforcement. Is it the same over your, all over your country or do you have different enforcement uh, priorities and strategies in different country, in different cities and villages. So it needs to be standard. You need the drivers to be going through the, the country, the transport uh, industry, the buses, to know that if they go through one city and they speed, they will be booked. They will be, they'll get a ticket. If they go through another city, uh, they'll get a ticket as well. But we know from many cities that, okay, Ah, oh, beware when you're going through this city because the traffic police are dynamite. They, they will guidelines they will for check you. But the uh, other cities you don't worry. So the solutions. buses and the transport and that they speed and drive through these cities and cause all sorts of problems. So do we have guidelines for uh, dealing with common enforcement solutions? And some of these the important things are the interface with the public. If a, if a traffic police officer pulls up a motorist and the motorist argues with them, becomes abusive. Do they have the arrest powers if uh, somebody is assaulted? Do they have the capacity to do anything about it? Have they been trained in human relations and how to be non-aggressive in the situation? What happens if it's a VIP who says, I, I am exempt from any traffic offences? Bribery and corruption, all these issues, we need to look at those types of things. Do we have uh, operating procedures uh, for all the equipment, for using breathalysers, for using speed equipment? 
So are they all written down so that no, it doesn't have to be a glossy publication, but it needs to be somewhere I can go and look at and say, what are the procedures for speed enforcement? What are the procedures for drink driving enforcement? What happens if somebody refuses a breath test? We need those guidelines uh, to work through. Do our strategies and tactics, uh, are we using the right things? Or are we just having a police officer on the corner directing traffic? Guidelines or for picking up people uh, for no mirrors or something solutions. when they should be looking at speed enforcement. So we need our strategies and tactics to be working right. Our method of operation. We get uh, in our programs and our enforcement practices, we say we have 10 police officers here in this location and 10 traffic police officers here, 10 over here. They all work shift work and we may have two or three officers working each day in each of those locations. Not enough. So do we use our strategies, do we combine our resources and make our uh, enforcement highly visible and more practised? Key principles of enforcement, and these are relevant, uh, it doesn't matter what area of enforcement you are working in. You must be actively enforcing. If a police officer is standing on the corner doing nothing, that's not active enforcement. If they're talking, it's not active enforcement. Right? We need to be actively doing uh, some actions and, and working hard. Even coming here this morning, I was uh, impressed with some of the traffic wardens and they're whistling and they're doing things and they're making sure that the traffic is all under control, the pedestrians stop, and this is good. It's good because as a pedestrian, I know. Right? As a driver, I know I'm going to be stopped or what. So this is, you need that active enforcement. If you stand there just watching, like, like in some countries, they have five police officers on an intersection and they, every now and again a crash happens and they come and make sure the crash is all fixed up and tidied up and then they stand back again and another crash happens. So that's not active enforcement. So it doesn't achieve anything. So you might need to make sure that all the officers are doing something constructive. So we must have evidence base. We must have that the crash data is critical for the whole of the program. And you must actively work with the road safety partners. These types of interface that we're having now, you should be having back in your own country. Right? You should all be good friends and, and know each other and working together. And if your transport people are doing something, they need to involve the police. The police are doing something, they involve the education people. So it's all working together as one big family, a road safety family. So we talk about evidence-based, intelligent-led and outcome-focused. We want to make sure that what we're on about is dynamic in the delivery. We want to create an impact. That's what it's all about, impact, scarce resources. So we provide here some information for you. That see, we need to be active, highly visible, outcome focused. What's our outcome? Saving lives, evidence based. We want to make sure what we are doing is based on evidence and it's intelligence led. We're using the intelligence and the knowledge to gain the way, the strategy we're going to work in the future and a dynamic delivery. So policing, road policing is really a scientific structure, putting it all together. It's not just get out there and look after the traffic or make sure that there's no crashes or make sure that uh, the traffic flows nicely. That's a thing of the past, that's history, but many of your countries will focus on that uh, now. You need to lift Lift your activity to, to work on uh, the enforcement strategy. Okay, we like to think of ourselves as a champion boxer. We train hard, you improve your skills, you plan your strategy, you want to throw good punches and deliver your enforcement activities. Make sure you hit the target. That's what it's all about, targeted enforcement. Get the target and deliver a knockout punch. That's the results. We want to make sure we achieve the results. I like to come back to one of the old Chinese uh, sayings from years ago and that is you can win a hundred victories, a hundred battles, you can defeat your enemy in battle, uh, but to subdue your enemy without fighting is the best of skill. And that's what road policing is all about. It's not about issuing thousands and thousands of tickets, it's not about being oppressive and uh, authoritarian over uh, the drivers. It's about working together with the community to achieve the same outcome. So you cannot 
catch everybody that's drink driving, you cannot catch every speeder, never. No country, you don't have the resources, you never do it. So you're better to do the strategy of working together with your partners to achieve the outcome. Okay, international success, strong enforcement of legislation. So you must have your foundation legislation. You must have education in the community to increase the knowledge. You must have sustained publicity campaigns to increase awareness. And you must balance the mix of education and enforcement. We are talking yesterday in the strategy for safe to school, safe to home program and the majority of the program is taken up with education, awareness and that sort of thing. Where is the enforcement? Maybe 10%. Right? But the whole concept is you must marry education and enforcement. If you are doing enforcement, you must have education. So every time a driver is given a ticket, they must be given some education about why? Here's a ticket for speeding, sir. Thank you. Okay. Don't speed again. That, all, that doesn't tell the person anything. Speeding is dangerous. Ten people were killed here over the last six months. This is the reason we're out patrolling speed. Would you tell your friends? Right? Two minutes worth of education, hundred dollar ticket, uh, but you're still doing the same thing. If you're doing education in schools, if you're doing education anywhere, you need the enforcement to back it up. If you're doing engineering, you need the enforcement to back it up. Build new highways, cars go faster, more crashes. Right? Because there's no cooperation with the police. You need to look at the enforcement strategies that lock in with the engineering strategies so that you have an interrelationship with everything. So we want to uh, have sustained publicity campaigns and we want to reduce the incidence severity and cost to the community of uh, road safety. Uh, we have a, a model for policing and you can look at that uh, in your leisure but we talk basically about uh, the major issues of highly visible and active enforcement. Repeated often. Six weeks uh, for between enforcement programs is not repeated often. We can't do it every day but we need to make sure that uh, we repeat the enforcement programs often. We need to be fair and consistent, no bribery, corruption, no favouritism. So we need to look at that as a strategy and all our enforcement activity needs to be well publicised. The more you can use the media, the more effective your whole program will be. So you use your media, gives the police authority. If you say we're having a campaign uh, over your water festival or over your major uh, campaign issues, that gives the police authority to do the actual enforcement because it's in the media. The Commissioner has uh, been up there announcing it. But bear in mind that most of these enforcement strategies over TET, the water festival, uh, any of your major issues, the police are involved in security and they have very little time for enforcement. So it's a self-defeating issue but many people are killed during these uh, programs. We look at deterrence and prevention. So the balance between uh, committing the offences or preventing people committing the offences and deterring those uh, from committing the offences. So in your program, your, your workbook there, you just have that so that you can look at that and, and deal with that uh, more extensively. In your program when it gets to train the trainer, these are questions that you'll be asking uh, your trainers to deliver. So dynamic leadership, how can police leaders impact more on changing behaviours of the attitude of drivers? I don't want you to answer that now but I want you to think about that for the future, to take it forward. So individual personal assessment. We all think of great leaders. In your country you'll have leaders who are highly respected. Police leaders, road safety leaders, uh, some people who have very good skills and uh, ability. What do I need to do myself? So everybody needs to do a self-assessment of their leadership skills. So we, we ask each of the students in your respective groups to look at their leadership skills. What are they missing? What would they like to be and how can they develop uh, those leadership skills? Ethics and accountability, a major issue in all your countries. Right? In most of your countries we have a, a commission for uh, ethics or anti-corruption commission. You can all check your own level of, uh, on the international stage through Transparency International and open uh, internet access. You can see where your country is on the 
on the International Register of uh, Corruption. And the, the issue is that the frontline corruption is always pointed at the police. But quite frequently, the corruption goes right through the government areas and people always say, we must uh, stop the police accepting bribes. But it's, it's the whole community and we need to say, how can we do some, uh, uh, some important programs to look at that and what are the ethics responsible uh, to try and minimise those issues. So, major issue, uh, we need to look at the standards to make sure that the police officers can follow standards. We need to understand that your reputation will be ruined just through some simple acts of uh, corruption if their uh, people are identified uh, with corrupt practices. And uh, we ask the police to take the lead and deal with these issues to try and eliminate uh, those frontline corruption. So bribery and corruption is a big issue uh, because it devalues road safety. If I know I can pay $10 or $20 and I will not be prosecuted, my name will not be recorded, I will not lose demerit points, if I know I do that, I will continue to speed, I will continue to drink drive. So how are we doing anything at all positive in road safety? So these are issues that are uh, working on the negative cultures of the community. The damage is the reputation. Again, when you have your program back in your country, we want to challenge those issues of uh, corruption and accountability. So we want your participants and students back home, your trainers, to understand this and raise it as an issue. We don't like to think about it, but it happens, it's there, and we need to do something about it. Uh, quickly, we want to understand the need, why we need the evidence. We want to understand the sources of intelligence understand the risk factors and to work with analysed crash data and to know what the real road trauma costs are and to know how to use the data proactively. Triple A, I'd like to think of this to make sure that you can understand what data is all about. We're just introducing this as a, as a key and simple issue. We need to acquire the data so that we can analyse it so that we can achieve. Right? A, 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 easy. That's what we need data for. If we're not doing the, the data in that way, then we're misusing the information that we have. So where do we get the, the data from? Most countries just use the police data, the crash data. Sometimes that's not highly uh, accurate and it's always underreported. But we can get data from other areas. Analyse it. We need to understand the patterns, what's happening. In, in Asia, I see now, Mobile phones are going to be a big issue, right? Because you've, you've got, we talk about speed, overloading, enforcement, but you go out there and you see people using mobile phones and it's all not known because as the police come along, they investigate the crash and how do we know that the person was using the mobile phone? They all deny it and somebody's dead, so we don't know, we don't do the investigation properly. So we need to understand the cause and effect and then importantly, we need to use the data to achieve, achieve good outcomes. So you apply your strategic enforcement, your evidence-based focus, and you assess your enforcement uh, effectiveness. To understand, so we need to understand why we do the enforcement, what are the benefits, what are the community attitudes, what are the uh, regional priorities and plans. So we need to know the road safety purpose and, and this is where you get your local police officers involved in, in understanding what it's all about and your local road safety experts uh, working together. So the data sources, I've just listed a number there and I said there's, there's many, many data sources. Your hospital, your medical, your coroner's uh, court, the results of your breath tests, uh, all the information coming from different areas. So whatever your data sources are now, doesn't matter which country you're in, you can expand them dramatically. Road safety research, why do people speed? Why do they drink and drive? All this is good data source to come in to help us to be smarter. So the more information we've got, the smarter we are, the more effective our enforcement can be. Okay, identify the real causes of crashes. We ask, what is the cause of that crash? Speeding. That's not a cause of that crash. Right? It's, it's just put down as a tick 
Yeah, speeding, tick the box. Why was the person speeding? Why did the people think they had the right to speed in that area? What education had been provided? What enforcement is there? So we can all be responsible for a crash that causes uh, people to die and it's easily put down as speeding. Or human error. What's human error? Nobody has a, 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 um, an offence in their statutes for human error and yet quite often we hear people say, oh, human error was the cause of 60% of our crashes or 90% of our crashes. I've never seen anybody charged with human error anywhere. So why do we have this concept of human error? Right? It's a sin. Right? Careless driving, dangerous driving, speeding, drink driving, it's all a, an offence in your country. So we need to understand what is the real cause of the crash. Okay, the risk factors in your country. We need to understand speeding, drink driving, uh, no helmets, uh, what do you see as the major causes? And they will probably all be different for your countries, but we need to understand those. Okay, what are the three most critical driver behaviours? So this is again uh, a plan for your officers, your road safety people to work out. What do we think are the most critical driver behaviours? They may be speeding, drink driving, no helmets, overloading, whatever. So they will be different, fatigue. So we want people to classify the top three uh, for their country and then maybe a fourth and then you work on those. So if you're picking people up for parking and your offences, major offences are speeding, you're wasting resources. So these are things we need to, to look at. Analyse the problem. Use the pictures, analyse the problems. and achieving results. We use intelligence, tactical intelligence, operational intelligence and strategic intelligence. In your resource manual uh, there's information about those three categories. And the clear message is that the police data sources are, are uh, relevant for all agencies. We need them to be accurate, reliable and timely. If we're careless in our data sources, if we have delays, if we have omissions, uh, if we have under-reporting, uh, then that distorts the value. We should be declaring the under-reporting and know as a percentage. So we please the identify the problem. We, we identify what this situation is, we police the problem and then we evaluate and then we continue that cycle. So it's all about continuous improvement in your program to make sure that you you target your enforcement towards the particular issues that are relevant and then you uh, police the enforcement and then you evaluate. Okay, so just on a summary, intelligence is having the information, analysing it and out of that you get intelligence. That makes us smart. We gather as much information as we can, analyse it and then we use it as intelligence uh, and strategies for the future. And it's relevant for all your organisations. The police data is the foundation of the way your strategy should be. Our intelligent focus, uh, we use it to, from analyse crash data, we channel our resources. We don't have enough resources so we need to make sure we channel our resources and then we attack the heart of the problem. It's no good, you can't stop every motorist, right? You need to look at where the heart, where the problem is, where the critical ris risks are and then you go for the heart. Right? If we want to kill the problem, or we want to solve the problem, we go for the heart. Where are we going to get our maximum benefit from uh, our resources? And uh, I have four problems here. Uh, the first problem here is what are the barriers to effective enforcement in your country? Right? If you don't have a police officer at your table, it doesn't matter. You can still look at what the issues are because you will know from your general knowledge what the police are complaining about. What are the issues there? We can always say, we haven't got enough resources. No, nobody's got enough resources. We haven't got enough money. Nobody's got enough money. We haven't got enough equipment. All right? How are we going to deal with those? So if we forget about those three issues and say, what are, the, what are the key barriers? What are the problems that our countries are facing? 
and what are the solutions. So we just need to look at those issues and they can be simply one, two, three, four, five and a solution. How are we going to attack the solution? Question two, what can be done to more effectively use intelligence and analysis to, to, to produce better road safety results? So if you're from the police organisation you might have, uh, you want to improve your data sources. If you're from external to the police you may want data sources to be able to be used by uh, your own organisation. So how can, how can we boost the quality of the police data so that everybody benefits? This is what it's done about. And we're asking you to deal with these questions at a very high level uh, and, a, and a very um, reasonable response. And we know if we had planning time you'd probably spend a week and have a steering committee back in your own country to deal with them. But we want you just to flag the issues so that we can know where to go in the future. The third problem uh, is, and uh, we need the police uh, particularly and other agencies to understand how much road safety and road trauma costs in your country. We, we don't know really uh, the end result. Most um, countries uh, will have some guesstimates about it, but we need to know there are many, many issues that uh, involve um, cost to road safety. These are the rescue services, the police services, uh, coronial services, uh, investigations, hospitals, there are many, many issues that cost money in your community. So if you can stop one crash, then you save money on your uh, gross domestic product. And lastly, uh, if, you, if you don't answer the other three questions, I'd like you to answer this one. All right? And that is, as a leader or a leadership group for your country, what three actions are you going to ensure happens when you go back to your country? All right? What are you going to take away from this program? And perhaps Rob should ask this question again at the end of the, the uh, four or five sessions that you're having with the different um, uh, presenters. Right? What are you going to do when you go home? We often come to conferences and that's fine. We, we learn something but we never do anything about it when we go home. So, and what I'd like you to do is, as a leader, are you sufficiently confident to actually write down these three, three points and then look at it in three months' time and say, okay, I promised uh, uh, in Manila that we would do X, Y, Z, one, two, three. And look at it in three months' time or six months' time and say, what have I done? Nothing. Oop. Okay, so what excuses are we going to have for not doing them?